August 18, 1960. 100 miles above Earth, a secret race in space has started. Corona, America's first photographic spy satellite, has just been deployed. The capsule was packed with over half a mile of film. The camera could capture images of objects as small as a truck on Russian territory, at least on a clear day. The satellite would be taking pictures. A uh, parachute would open. They'd go to all this trouble of capturing this uh, capsule that's coming back down to Earth. Aircraft would rush it from Hawaii, where they're capturing it, to Washington, where they're developing the film, and then they put it on these big light tables. And they look at these pictures, and what do they have? They have pictures of the tops of clouds. It was the nuclear missile bases under those clouds that Corona was supposed to find. The smartest engineers the CIA could find had gotten it off the ground. On my mark. But in space, it was missing a human touch. Some thought it could never work without a human at the controls, without a finger on the shutter. The argument was that if we had a man up there, he would have more flexibility and judgment in, in looking at areas of interest. And spying was just one possibility. One of the more amazing documents that we got was this list of experiments. Among those were going up there and capturing a Russian satellite, maybe knocking a Russian satellite out of orbit or completely destroying a Russian satellite. But the risk of launching astronauts on covert missions to space was enormous. Any attempt had to be kept completely secret. Only a handful of people know what really happened. You just couldn't tell anybody about it. Nobody. I didn't tell my wife anything. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to. The program is still classified. Nobody's ever told us it wasn't. Up next on NOVA. A space story you've never seen. The story of the Astro Spies. the height of the Cold War, and 13 miles above the Soviet Union, all systems will go. The CIA's secret U-2 spy plane was on a mission to confirm an alarming intelligence tip. A new Soviet nuclear missile base close to the Arctic was about to become operational. So this made the White House very nervous. It was in a position where it could launch missiles over the North Pole, which was the shortest route from Russia to the United States. The U-2's cameras were technological marvels, but the key to the U-2's success was the pilot's ability to find and photograph the best targets. The Soviets, you know, would threaten us when they could get away with it. So we needed to know where their technology was. We needed to know what they were doing in the missile field where the silos were, what kind of missiles they had. The U-2's pilot was Francis Gary Powers. He thought if he flew above 60,000 feet, he should be safe. No Soviet anti-aircraft missiles could reach him. He was wrong. When Gary Powers was shot down, the president said, no more U-2 overflights. So that, was, that put the United States in a very bad position. We had these U-2s and we couldn't fly them over the Soviet Union. You don't want to cause a provocation and you don't want to be shot down. You know, what's the answer? Well, you go up into space. 
This is Mercury Control. The countdown is now T-minus. Launch Complex 5-6 at Florida's Cape Canaveral is a monument to the early days of space exploration. Now a museum, it was once NASA's command center for the launch of Alan Shepard, America's first man in space. All systems are go. In December 2004, NASA Special Agent Dan Oakland was called over to the old blockhouse to help solve a problem. With trying to find some keys to a door that was closed for a, a good number of years. The lock was so old, Oakland's office was the only one that still had the master key. There was no lights or anything, and we started looking around with flashlights. Buried back in the corner was a blue box. Inside the box, he found something extraordinary. Two spacesuits, different from any NASA spacesuits. The suits are in pretty good condition, and they were just a little bit soiled. There's one that was 007 and then 008. They're just printed on the suits themselves. And there was something else that seemed strange. That was a name tag that was actually on it on the sleeve, and it just said lawyer. I've been following space and espionage for a long time. And after I heard the story of Dan Oakland finding these spacesuits, I thought it was extremely interesting. For James Bamford, an author and investigative reporter, that name Lawyer became a window into a hidden world. There was a small article about these suits in a space website. And it was very curious. Because if you look at the list of NASA astronauts, there's never been a NASA astronaut named Lawyer. But I did find the name Lawyer, Captain Richard E. Lawyer on a list of pilots chosen to be part of an Air Force space program in the 1960s. When I looked closely at the program, I realized it had been run by a secret agency inside the Pentagon. Well, I did manage to get some documents. Much of the program, even 40 years later, is still officially secret. The lawyer's name was on a list of 17 pilots who were chosen for the program. I managed to talk to him off camera about a month before he died. And the information he gave me helped me find 10 of the other pilots who are still alive. It's an impressive group. Some of the pilots Bamford found became space shuttle astronauts. Vice Admiral Richard Truly even became the head of NASA. Lieutenant General James Abramson was put in charge of President Reagan's Star Wars program. General Robert Jerez would become vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. None of them has ever talked publicly about the secret that ties them all together. An Air Force program called Mole. It's one of the great untold stories of the Cold War. The story begins in January 1964, with a new group of America's best military pilots arriving at Edwards Air Force Base in California. They had been assigned to train at a place called ARPS, the Aerospace Research Pilot School. So I arrived at Edwards into what they called ARPS. Didn't know a soul. Run by Chuck Yeager, the first man to fly faster than the speed of sound, ARPS was a school where some military pilots with the right stuff were groomed to become astronauts in NASA's civilian space program. This year, it was different. As we went through our student year and got toward the fall, we realized that something funny was going on. And the thing that was funny going on was they were actually uh, conducting a uh, secret, I guess you'd say, a s crew selection. 